Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, cool. Everything works. I'm surprised. Uh, hello. Uh, I'm Willy Bald. I'm currently working in a company I don't want to mention. Uh, and uh, this talk, which is going to be about the basics of containers or what they are and how it works, uh, it's really for beginners. So if you're if you know what the container is, you have like really good idea, then you're probably not going to learn anything new. But this was sort of a project which um, helped me to understand what's going on because my first experience was really like containers, yes, cool, and then uh, I didn't really know what I'm doing and a lot of the stuff was breaking all the time. And uh, I suffered a lot, and then I decided, okay, maybe I should, maybe I should understand a little bit more what it really is. Uh, so what we are going to cover is like define what the container is. It has been mentioned many times over here, but uh, I think it's worth always repeating it again and again, uh, and how it actually is created uh, from all the basics, and then like what really are the steps. Uh, syscalls and so on, how you actually make it work. So what it really is, like my idea at the beginning was there is some runtime, something special and so on, uh, that it's some kind of VM or something similar. Uh, well, it's not the case. I learned like, oh, this is just a process, nothing else. Okay. And oh, it has some changes. So it doesn't see the file system the same way as other processes and it, has, it cannot consume more memory and it cannot do certain things, but otherwise it's still just a process, nothing else. Uh, so basically the kernel is the runtime, to put it this way. So how you actually achieve this? Because, uh, well, if it's just a process, then there are certain things you can do, like setting U limits and so on. Yes, but uh, that's not really isolated very well, right? And so the kernel has certain features and there are certain things we can put together in a clever way to actually achieve this isolation. So one of the things which was definitely mentioned many times is namespaces. Uh, then control groups. Yeah, uh, I'll show you what, it, what these things really mean and uh, how you set up the networking because that's another part. Like you can have many devices and so on. And then there is SCN, Farmer, and a lot of other things, which I'm not going to cover because that's, uh, that would be another talk, really. So what are the namespaces? Well, it's, uh, it's really just a, how to put it nicely, uh, a hierarchical structure of uh, really namespaces. There's nothing to it. It just uh, isolates the resources, so it actually wraps them. And if you create a new namespace, it actually wraps the real resource, like let's say uh, uh, PIDs, and it starts one fresh. But it's just a virtual thing. It's not really something special. It's in the kernel. It's in. It's attached to the process, so you can you can see it's just a subset of the real thing. Right, and there's a couple of them. Uh, the list actually is complete, and you can see in which kernel version it was introduced. So the mount is basically uh, blocks or uh, isolates the mount points, so you can have different views of the file systems, and so on. Uh, then you have the host name, IPC stuff, uh, PID network, users, C groups. And uh, because it's hierarchy, uh, there's all, every process is always in some namespace. And these are different namespaces and, and, and process can be in different, uh, it has to be always in some, name, in, in some of the namespace in those groups. So you have, like, these are, how many is them? Seven. So it's always in seven, but will be different. So you can mix them together in different ways and limit it completely. Quite, you can do quite strange stuff with these things. Uh, so uh, how it is created? There is a system call called clone, which is basically the same thing as fork, but you can tell it to create a new namespace. 
in and you define what namespaces you're interested in. And if you create a new one, it actually is, uh, most of the time, it's as in empty. Let's say in the example of network, uh, when you create a new namespace with network, the only device you see is loopback. No other devices. Uh, and there's unshare, which means like create a new one because I'm getting rid of the, uh, the one I have at the moment. And the set NS, that's for adding stuff to the existing namespace. So for example, the mount namespace, how it works. So you can see there's a, I hope this is the, yeah. So this is one mount namespace. And it sees these things. Right, this is process one and it's process two and it, it has these mount points there. And there's another name, uh, mount namespace and it sees completely different world, right? Because they are totally, totally different. And you can actually, whatever action you do in one of the mount namespaces, it's not propagated anywhere. It stays in the, in the namespace. So if you start in another process in, uh, in the mount uh, namespace two, it will have will see this. And if you do changes there, it will never be propagated here, which is pretty, pretty useful and isolates the file system. Then there is the PID namespace, the PIDs, which relays hierarchy again. And uh, you can see that the real, there's a real PID, which, sees the, which the kernel runs. Or if you look at it in the host, you see the process has these IDs, the, the black ones. So it goes really one, two, three, four, five, so, so, and so on. But if you are in a new namespace, you start again from one again. So the first process in the new namespace it should be really kind of in it, right? Because it, uh, because it is PID one. And, uh, <clears throat> and it should really reap uh, zombies and so on, the process is to clean, it, clean up the space because you are still exhausting the root, the, the main PID. So there's always, if you create new processes in the namespace, there are still PIDs uh, created in the, in the root PID namespace. So one of the reasons why there, I've seen a couple of talks like, what should be a PID one in a container? Because if you, because you can exhaust the pit, for example. And then there's, so this was example of namespaces, and you can do this for the network where you create just, where the only thing you can see is the loopback device. So we have to edit some, somehow add the device to the namespace so it's visible. So then uh, there's control groups, which is really sort of limiting the resource usage. And there's a bunch of them, uh, these are just examples, and they all reside in uh, the SysFS C group. And you can see what is there. Um, uh, there's plenty of it. And you can set different things and then add processes, processes to the to given group. That means that if it's in the group, it applies all the policies you set, like let's say uh, it is just one core, one CPU, not more, and so on. So you can mix mix those things together and the process can be, you know, for example, I think there's an example, yes. Uh, you can create one easily, you create just a, in the memory subset, you create a directory. And that's how you created a new group. And then you, and the kernel actually populates this with a bunch of files which you can set, uh, set like, uh, sorry, where you can set different things like how memory, uh, how the, oh, uh, the out of memory killer works and so on. And if you want to add a process to this, to this group, you just write the, uh, the, the PID of the process in the C group prox. That's it. And all of a sudden, all the rules you defined apply to the process. Uh, so, and then there's the networking. I said that when you create a new mount, mount space, uh, sorry, network uh, namespace, there's just loopback. The thing is that for the real devices, like the hardware devices, they can only be always, always in one namespace. So uh, you never have enough cards to run all the containers. You don't have. So that's where comes the virtual devices. So you 
uh, I hope that you know what the virtual devices are. Just a little bit. It's like fake cards connected together. Okay, they come in pairs always. And uh, then you create a bridge or a, a virtual switch or some mechanism how you can connect those uh, together. And then the most important part is you now you have to set up routing and so on. So you, uh, you start with IP tables magic. For example, if you have Docker and you do uh, and you look at the IP tables, you see what Docker does. It creates a bridge called Docker Zero, and then it puts uh, a bunch of things there, uh, NAT and so on. It's pretty complicated, so uh, I'm not going to cover IP tables. This would be another talk again. So and then a lot of, uh, many times you you know you hear image container image container image. Uh, it actually what it is it has nothing to do with the container as such really because uh, it, it really is, is a tarball that's it no special uh, magic there and uh, you basically pick up files you want to the container to see or to execute. So the real thing is yeah, you get tarballs and tarballs and some uh, files around it to actually say what is what. And that actually gets, uh, you untar this to, to your file system somewhere and then you make uh, uh, some magic. So now I'll show like sort of code which actually shows you how the, the, run, the container runtime actually works. Uh, so this, uh, it took me a while because I was digging this out from the uh, Docker, really. But that's, these are the steps which you need to do and you get it working. So you first, you have some container execution function, which is sort of sh like a shell, let's say. So uh, you, you call the clone and you put what namespaces you want. And then you get PID which uh, there's a new process there, and you can put in the C groups, you can add network, you can add a lot of stuff to this process. And then you just wait till it finishes so you can clean up everything. And now this is the container part. Now the, this, this bit is already running in a different process, and that's the container already. So, but you want to modify things, so you start, you don't want to see the ProcFS, for example, as it is. So you have to unmount it. Then you have a thing called pivot root, which really is almost the same as, as, uh, as uh, ch root. You change the root of the file system somewhere, but the, the cool thing is that you still have access to the old one, so you can copy stuff to the new one. Uh, to the new route, so we can copy, let's say, some configuration files, or we can, uh, like, let's say, uh, for example, as the examples, as the resolve conf, or you can copy different things, and then you unmount it, and you see all, only the only the the new route, and then you mount again the profile system, the devices, and so on, and you set up a network, and. Uh, then you execute whatever you wanted to execute, as in bin bash, for example, or whatever the entry point for the container is. And that's it. So uh, now I'm going to talk about how the file system works in the container world, because you know the, the images are immutable. You shouldn't be really able to change the, the image. But the container needs to write some files or create certain things. So here comes something which is called, generally speaking, unioning file systems or so, or, uh, or union file system. And there's example like AUFS or now in the mainline kernel, the overlay. But there are other approaches how you can achieve what we want to achieve. And that is having some immutable layer, which is the image. Then you have some uh, upper layer, which is writable, let's say, or it's just another layer, and you can stack them on top. And then and there is a final 
version of it, which actually shows uh, the hierarchy and creates creates a view where that's what the f what the container sees. So, uh, but if it writes anything, it goes to the upper layer and no, never on the lower layer. So that the image is immutable. You can't really change it. You can change. You can do things in the container, and you can still you know start the container again and so on. And it will still have the same thing, but you will see that the image is immutable. Then there's the networking part, which that's what Docker does. It creates the bridge, the Docker zero, and then when it's, it tries to start a new container, it creates the virtual devices, the pair, and one is added to the bridge, the other one to the namespace of the container process. And that's it. No special magic. Well, IP tables, sure. Uh, so, because uh, I've got five minutes, right? Am I right? Five minutes. So I can uh, show you a demo, which is really a, it's a single C file, roughly three or 400 lines, including a lot of comments, so you can really see what's going on. Uh, and I hope, no, that's not the one. So I can show you the, um, if you want to look at the code, it's on the, on the GitHub, but uh, I can show you, well, uh, like, yeah, I can, what I can show is that like over here, I'm not sure if it's really visible. Can you see it? Yeah, clearly. So there, are, there is a directory called containers. So there's containers and then images. There's the low layer, there's the upper layer uh, in the unit file system. And the, this bit here, the tar, is really just Docker export, the running container. You get the file system, which is tar, and that's what's in the, inside the image. So. And yeah, I might show you the, the IP tables. So uh, you can see Docker creates a bunch of things as a network, Docker zero device and so on. Docker zero IP tables everywhere. So it creates, that's, cre that's how it creates the network and so. So now I'm, I'm running a container now. It actually is done and ready. So uh, what it actually does, it creates a network. It gives this address, this IP address. It uses Debian as the base image, which is really the path to the images. And it runs bin bash in, inside it. And you can, now you can see like what's going on. It clones, network set up, waiting for, for the host actually to everything set up. And then container creates the unioning file system, the directories, creates the, what's, the, what's actually the root now, and creates the old root, new root, mounting stuff, and executing bin bash. So if I look at uh, it now, no, okay, just the root, uh, it's the root file system of Debian. And let's say I go home. Okay. There's one file actually, so I create another one. You can see there are two files, and if I go to uh, the containers, I want, oh, I need to do it as a root, okay. Yeah, there are, these are the layers, and if I, if I look at the, uh, okay. You 
you can see that it compli it's the same again, the same root file system. And I can go home and you would see the files here. Right. So if I look at the IP, uh, oh no. uh, IPA, see these are the devices there. So you get loopback in the virtual device, nothing else. It's separated. But actually, it's, it is uh, just a process on, on, uh, on, the, on the file system, on the, on the host. It's nothing special. I'll try to. Yeah, so you can see that I'm trying to find, you can see over here that I'm running these processes and there is some bash all of a sudden as a root, which is the process actually being run in the in the in the container. See these are the container images. So I hope it helps you to understand what's going on, how it's put together and thanks a lot. <laughs>